All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's joining us today. I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to join us for this Conscious Capitalism virtual gathering. My name is today at to start off. Um, my name is Alexander McCobin. I am the CEO here at Conscious Capitalism Inc. And just so appreciate that you're taking the time to learn and grow in community with Conscious Capitalism. Today, we're going to be joined by Professor Ed Freeman, who is known to us, to many of us, as the father of modern stakeholder theory to explore business without trade offs. As many of you know, conscious capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of capitalism and business. It's a movement of business leaders around the world working to improve the practice and perception of capitalism to elevate humanity. And Conscious Capitalism Inc. is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing that movement. Every week, we offer virtual gatherings as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and business practices of those in our network. And today's gathering is going to run for about 45 minutes. Ed's going to share with us uh, some initial thoughts for 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to transition to questions from you in the audience during the last 10, 15 minutes. So if at any point you have a question that you want to ask Ed, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any technical questions or issues, email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Ed Freeman. For 30 years, he's written about stakeholder theory in business, and in 2020, he published his most recent book on the subject called The Power of And, Responsible Business Without Trade-Offs. He's the academic director of the Business Roundtable Institute for Corporate Ethics at the Darden School at the University of Virginia, and we've been honored to have him join the board of directors here at Conscious Capitalism just this year. With that, I'm not going to hold us up any longer. I'm just going to say, welcome, Ed. Thank you for everything that you have done and are doing and for joining us today. Alexander, uh, thanks very, very much for that uh, introduction. Um, <clears throat> it's really a pleasure uh, to, to be here. Uh, I've been involved in conscious capitalism uh, for a long time. Uh, and Alexander, as many people, give me way too much credit uh, about the stakeholder idea. Uh, I, I didn't invent it. I, I did uh, claim to be the only person who had written about it who did not claim to have invented it. <laughs> but uh, be, be that uh, as it may, uh, it's nice now that people are taking the stakeholder ideas seriously. Uh, as some people like John Mackey and Kip Tyndall and others have been taking it seriously for a long time. They've been out building businesses, uh, you know, while uh, I've been a deadbeat academic just writing about it. Now, it's also true that a lot of years ago, in a fit of sort of optimism and idealism, uh, I went to get a PhD in philosophy. And as some of you know, I've, I've told this before, you know, my father's uh, response, he's a dirt farmer in Georgia, was, well, you, you know, you'll, you won't have any trouble getting a job because, you know, they just opened a whole bunch of new philosophy factories out by the interstate. Uh, and I was very lucky uh, to end up as a, as a, with a postdoc position at Wharton. Um, and that's where I encountered a bunch of people who were, who were using this uh, idea about stakeholders, uh, et cetera. Fast, and so I became a kind of one trick pony writing about that. Fast forward a whole bunch of years, in days of the Obama administration, uh, I was invited uh, to, the, to the White House to, with a whole bunch of people, all of whom were trying to figure out what's the next version of capitalism gonna be like. That this idea of uh, shareholder exclusivity you know, uh, capitalism is only about the money, it's only about shareholders, didn't seem to be working very well. And there were lots of people who were proposing uh, alternatives for that. Uh, I think Raj was at uh, Sisodia, was at one of those meetings, uh, Jeff Cherry, the people who do Just Capital, uh, and uh, Kip, Kip, Kip Tyndall was one of the uh, leaders of the meeting with uh, uh, Tom Perez, who was Secretary of Labor. 
uh, at the time was at the Labor Department. And the uh, people who were worried about impact investing and ESG investing and um, connected capitalism and inclusive capitalism uh, and the other uh, 30 or 40 versions uh, of reform uh, were there. You know, they were there because there's there's been this debate about uh, what what capitalism should be, how we can make it better. Um, and as people began to, to talk about, well, what's the right brand? Is it conscious capitalism? Uh, you know, my favorite ver version of this, or is it uh, something else? Is it ESG impact investing? <clears throat> as people talked about the, the, the question of brand, um, you know, I began to think that maybe this is not the best question that we could ask because at some level, as devoted as I am to conscious capitalism, I don't care what the brand is. But what I care is that we make business better, that we make it fit for human beings, uh, which the old story of business uh, simply uh, is not. And so it seemed to me a slightly different question and maybe a little bit a better one even was what are the four or five ideas that absolutely have to be there for uh, this revision of capitalism, whatever it is. Uh, and of course, conscious capitalism has its four pillars, but I went in a slightly different direction uh, from, from, from that. Uh, and that's why we uh, wrote uh, this book called The Power of And, Responsible Business Without Trade-Offs. Uh, I think it's completely consistent with conscious capitalism. Uh, in fact, we, we dedicated the book to uh, John Mackey and uh, Kip Tindall and Jeff Cherry and uh, Tom and Dave Gardner uh, and the other CEOs who have uh, really made these ideas possible, uh, et cetera. Um, and these, these five ideas are uh, really around uh, you, using the word and, the most powerful word in the, in the English language, I think, and, and really comes from, uh, in part, uh, something from, from Jim Collins' uh, work, who I think most of you probably know, when he ta talked about the tyranny of the or. Well, the other side of the tyranny of the or is the power, is the power uh, of uh, and. Um, and uh, so we talked about, uh, we, we thought these four or five ideas were purpose and profit, stakeholders and shareholders, uh, society and markets, humanity and economics, and ethics and business. And these are pretty all encompassing ideas. Uh, we hope they uh, encompass conscious capitalism uh, and the other forms as well, uh, since we see this as uh, really a kind of big tent uh, let let a thousand flowers bloom, uh, and uh, not so much. Let's let's don't get caught up uh, in the in in the branding here. Um, so let me talk about each of these ideas uh, separately, and then we'll move to any questions that that you have. And I'll be quick about some of them because I know if you've tuned into the conscious capitalism uh, broadcast here. Um, um, uh, you, you're, you're, you're already pretty much on board uh, with uh, a lot of, of, of what I have to say. So purpose and profits, look, I've said a long time, many of you have heard me say that the old story of business, you know, the one that says it's about the money and greedy little bastards are trying to do each other in, the old story of business makes a mistake. It makes a logic mistake about purpose. Uh, look, businesses have to have profits to live. Uh, anyone who thinks otherwise just doesn't understand how business works. Just like I have to have red blood cells to live. But it doesn't follow that I need red blood cells to live, that it's a necessary condition for life, that the purpose of my life is to make red blood cells. The, lot, the argument, I need red blood cells to live, therefore the purpose of my life is to make red blood cells, is both not valid and unsound. Uh, and yet that's the argument we get a lot about the sort of old story of business. Business needs profits to live, therefore making profits is the purpose of business. 
Uh, and that's just a bad argument, whether you have a PhD in philosophy or not. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really uh, work. Purpose is something else. Uh, as John Mackey's often said, purpose is there because people are, you know, entrepreneurs start a business because of purpose. They're on fire about something, whether it's uh, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs with the personal computer revolution, whether it's John Mackey with trying to get us to eat more healthy, whether it's Skip Tindall trying to get us more organized, uh, wh whether even in a big company, it's Paul Pullman who believes uh, down to the soles of his feet that we have to live uh, much more uh, in sync with nature uh, and the earth and is trying to, and, and, and did move a very large organization uh, called Unilever uh, to do that better. Purpose is a very, very uh, powerful. Um, and if we can have a business that's purpose uh, driven and uh, focuses uh, on profits, uh, we can have a viable business of that last for a long time. Purpose is important. It's important to us personally. Uh, we want to live our lives with a sense of purpose. Uh, I try every day to inspire my students. I, I don't always, it doesn't always work, but that's, that's certainly part of uh, my own purpose. Uh, and many of you, many people in the conscious capitalism movement have devoted their lives to the study of purpose uh, and have really been able to uh, improve the world uh, and improve our understanding of capitalism by doing so. And I, I have a great debt uh, uh, to those uh, folks uh, who, who have done that. So uh, the first idea is that uh, business is about purpose and pro profits. You know all the signs that uh, uh, we've seen. We've seen the BlackRock letters. We've seen the uh, business roundtable uh, uh, statements uh, about that. Uh, and um, you know uh, that's uh, incredibly, incredibly important. Um, when Carmack says our purpose is to drive integrity in the automotive industry by being honest and transparent in every interaction. And they transform what it means to sell used cars. <laughs> the sort of paradigm case usually of, of sleazy behavior. Uh, we know purpose uh, really matters. The second is no, the second idea is no surprise. The second and any of you who have uh, listen, had to have been forced to listen to me over the past 40 years or so. We need stakeholders and shareholders. Look, <clears throat> the stakeholder idea is maybe a little bit different than it's often portrayed, at least my view of it. Uh, look, any business has always and always will create and, and sometimes destroy value for customers, suppliers, employees, communities, and the people with the money, and maybe others but certainly those uh, five uh, stakeholders for sure. For a lot of years, people thought the idea, the sort of magic of the stakeholder idea was look, there's more than shareholders. Uh, and they often juxtaposed uh, stakeholder theory with shareholder theory. I, I did a radio show in San Francisco uh, just two days ago. It was a sort of libertarian talk show, I guess. <clears throat> Uh, and the guy who, uh, whose show it was kept trying to juxtapose shareholders with stakeholders. And I kept not, you know, trying to argue, no, that's not right. You know, business, every business creates value for customers, suppliers, employees, communities, and the people with the money. And that the and is really important. The critical part of the stakeholder idea is the interdependence. It's that how you create value for customers determines in part how you create value for suppliers and employees and shareholders. And the interconnections of those stakeholders is, is what's important. Trying to find uh, what John Mackey calls win-win-win uh, solutions is, uh, is really in incredibly important. Now, when I wrote this old book and actually wrote it in 1982's publication dates 84, 
called strategic management of stakeholder approach. I, you know, I didn't even, I didn't think that uh, the stakeholder idea was very interesting. And the reason I didn't was, you know, even a dirt farmer in Georgia knew that you had to pay attention to those groups you could affect and those groups of individuals that could affect you. That seemed to me to be uh, life 101. Um, it was dirt farming 101. And I, I think it's business 101 uh, as, as well. In that book, I also talked a lot about purpose. I, I thought that was the most interesting part. Uh, nobody else did uh, in the early 80s, uh, I am uh, pleased to uh, report. Uh, and, uh, you know, for a long time, uh, no one much uh, cared about that. Um, stakeholders have a joint interest. Um, their interest needs not to be traded off, but the metaphor I like is harmonized. I dabble around in music and, you know, harmony is an idea that the notes are different, but they sound good together. Stakeholder interests are different. Uh, there's no way of, of getting them, um, you know, all to believe the same thing. You might get them roughly committed to purpose, but even there, what, what's important is that you make them sound good together. You harmonize uh, their, in, their interest. The other thing that's important here that's often not emphasized enough is the stakeholder idea says, look, this is about relationships. And relationships are not transactions and they're not series of, uh, you just add up the transactions. Business, the old story is, primarily about economic transactions. Uh, and we're always sort of starting from zero at each tra transaction. Relationships are different uh, than that. When, when you have a relationship with someone, there's a presumption that it's gonna continue. When you have a relationship with someone, you don't keep score all the time. You don't keep score every day. Uh, my my uh, wife of 43 years and I have spent probably more time together in the last year uh, under COVID than we have the previous 43 years. And it's been okay. I mean, you never know how those things are gonna go, but it's, it's, it's actually been uh, good. Uh, but if I were to go into her office and say, uh, baby, you know, I've been thinking about it and over 40, the last 43 years, I think you're up three, you owe me three. I'm pretty sure what the answer would be. Uh, would not be particularly healthy for me. She's a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. And, uh, you know, we don't keep store. Uh, we're both committed to some, something. Seeing stakeholders as a committed relationship and doing things to keep it committed relationships uh, is, is what's important. Well, there's purpose and profit, stakeholders and shareholders um, there's, we, we have to see business as embedded in society. One way I would put this, not, not just embedded in markets. The old story says, pay attention to markets. It's about competitive forces, etc. And yes, that's important, but more important is seeing business as a societal institution that makes, that's, that, that's able to allow us to flourish both as individuals uh, and as a society. Uh, and, you know, I, I, given the problems that we face, for instance, the vestigial limbs of the global financial crisis, which haven't gone away, the inequality, uh, and uh, especially the inequality of opportunity, uh, and the loss of hope uh, that, that many of our citizens have, um, if you add to that uh, racial injustice, uh, gender discrimination, uh, if you add to that problems in uh, education, uh, incredible new technologies that uh, make some of our ethics uh, obsolete, uh, if you uh, add to that something like, uh, I don't know, a pandemic, I don't think anybody's gonna argue hey, let's go double down on those shareholders, that that's gonna cause us to uh, 
uh, understand, or let's double down on understanding market forces. We have to see business as a societal institution, as capable of being part of the solution to these incredible pro problems. Nothing says this more than global warming. Uh, how do we figure out how to make things uh, better, faster, cheaper, and greener? Uh, and without business doing that, uh, I, I really don't think we have, um, you know, much chance at solving that. Now, having said that, of course, I think we can solve global warming. Uh, we've done an incredible uh, amount uh, of things. If I, if I think for a minute about this uh, iPhone, you know, how did we human beings get to an iPhone? Well, we figured out, uh, we, we actually invented a vocabulary for metal. We had to invent a vocabulary for glass. We had to invent the wonderful physics that's on the inside of this. Literally, we had to invent the vocabularies, learn how to use them, uh, learn how to cooperate together to make the stuff that the vocabularies made possible. So we invent vocabularies to solve our problems. That's what business is. And that's what human beings are, the fourth end. We have to see our humanity, our full humanity, as well as our economic interest. This idea that human beings are one dimensional uh, economic maximizers of their own narrow self interest uh, is an idea, if it was ever useful, it's certainly not now. And we all know this is not what human beings are. Anybody who's ever been a parent and a child, uh, been in love, uh, Christ lost someone uh, during this awful pan, pan pandemic, knows that we're capable of far more than thinking about our own individual self-interest. Yes, we do do that, but we also think about the interest of, of others, uh, our families, our communities, our loved ones. And so to say that human beings are narrowly self-interested is not, not worthy is to make business not worthy uh, of, of human beings. Uh, that's captured, I think, in conscious capitalism, in thinking about conscious leadership and conscious culture. I just want to call out the underlying assumption here that we need to bring all of our humanity and all, all of our knowledge, our, our art, our music, our history, and our science to understanding how we can make uh, how we can make business better. Um, so we we need purpose and profit, stakeholders and shareholders, seeing business as uh, societal forces and market forces, and seeing us as human beings as well as economic beings, human beings who invent vocabularies to solve their problems. If we see our humanity like that, the world is a world of abundance. It's a world of abundance. There's not much we can't do with what we have up here and what we're able to invent. And that for me captures in a sense this uh, optimism and idealism uh, about what's possible, uh, what's possible uh, with things like conscious capitalism and others. And finally, you know, I have to say uh, the, the fifth and is, you know, we have to deal with uh, business and ethics. We have to, uh, when I tell people I teach business ethics, you know, they have to kind of laugh or say business didn't have any or must be a short course or, you know, must, uh, must be a theoretical subject. Um, and, and I don't like those things because it says, business occupies the moral low ground. It ought to be on the moral high ground because for <clears throat> over the last several hundred years, it's radically changed the world and made it better. And it's in the process of doing the same thing. If you read some of the people who talk about the next industrial revolution with the AIs and all of that stuff, you ain't seen nothing yet from the computer revolution. Uh, we're at the edge of eliminating poverty in the world. Uh, I think we can eliminate uh, a lot of disease if, if we have the will to do it. 
And it doesn't mean necessarily the political will. Uh, it means the moral, the ethical will to uh, start uh, businesses, uh, to invent stuff to make our lives better, uh, and to see business uh, as a force for building a better society. Now, the danger here is that we engage in, you know, what, what I would call saints and sinners th thinking. The old story says most business people are sinners, uh, profits are bad, and uh, somehow they just want to maximize profits to themselves, uh, even though I think we would all say that's not true. Um, the way the old story goes, then you'll find some saints, uh, oftentimes companies like Whole Foods or some of the conscious capitalism co companies are, are put forward as saints. And then when they make a mistake or somebody says something that's uh, controversial, and that always happens because we're human beings, they automatically get moved over to the center category. Uh, I think uh, uh, John Mackey's had a lot of experience uh, with this in, in the media. Um, and Oscar Wilde said it best. He said, you know, every saint's got a past, every sinner's got a future. Uh, we need to stop saints and sinners thinking and start doing more human-centered thinking. So five ideas, regardless of what the end brand turns out to be, purpose and profits, stakeholders and shareholders, society and markets, humanity and economics, and ethics and business. Uh, I think if we can invent a capitalism that is responsive to those five things, like conscious capitalism is and others, uh, we will have made the world better. And that is in fact, uh, I think where the bar is for us uh, to be the generation that makes business better. Uh, let me stop there and uh, see if anybody has any questions, any uh, loud exclamations of that's the worst thing I've ever heard or uh, Freeman, you're an incredible one trick pony. Uh, pretty good trick, but still I admit to being a one trick po pony. So let's see what your uh, questions are. Alexander, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this to you. Thank you, Ed. And we are starting to get questions rolling in. If anyone has any other questions, <coughs> please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we're going to get to as many as we can today. The first one is from Bernard Moore, who is wondering if it's too cliche to talk about co-creating value with stakeholders versus creating value for or delivering value to in a unidirectional way. Uh, Bernard, that's a great question. Look, I'm, I'm a philosopher, so I think words matter here. Uh, I think co-creating is a is is a is a is a good uh, term. Uh, and creating for, uh, you know, I, what matters is that you mean it. Co-creating uh, is is a word is a phrase that I've heard tossed around a lot. And sometimes, you know, I, we're co-creating value. I didn't, and I didn't know I was co-creating it, uh, which means I wasn't. So I think co-creating. It means we really have to think through how we engage with our stakeholders on a continuous basis, uh, what the relationship is like, uh, and what we mean by partnership. Uh, I think those are incredibly important questions uh, and language not to be used lightly. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a, it can be a cliche, uh, but I hope most times uh, it's not, if that makes sense. Thank you, Ed. Um, the next question is from Will Funderburg, who is asking, do you think that customers ultimately own the power in how conscious businesses can be? If customers are more interested in non-conscious businesses for price, quality, or whatever reason, conscious businesses won't survive. And so should we be paying attention to educating customers and consumers? Well, again, that's another great question, Will. Um... If, 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 if customers are interested in price quality or whatever reason, then uh, conscious businesses have to deliver price quality uh, in a conscious way. Uh, the idea that uh, there's, there's, there's conscious bu bu business uh, and that's gonna be more expensive or less quality 
and there's non-conscious business, which is going to be kind of mass production, uh, lowest lowest quality at whatever cost, etc. Uh, I think that's a false choice. Look, you can always raise price to do stuff. That's just like you can't cost cut your way to greatness. You can't price rise your way to greatness. You have to figure out how customers, suppliers, employees, communities, and the people with the money, how those things go together, what the interactions are. And if there are some things uh, that you absolutely wouldn't do, uh, let's say things like discriminate against women or uh, people of color, uh, let's say uh, pay people uh, in a way that they can't live uh, or whatever those things are, you have to figure out a way to make those things uh, pay for everybody. That's why innovation is important. It's incredibly easy to say these things, I know, and they're hard to do. You know, the stakeholder idea is the simplest idea in, in the world. Uh, when my wife read this old book, she said, well, you know, she, she had by this time gone to Wharton to get an MBA. And she, uh, she read this old book and she said, you know, this is just common sense. You know, you're never going to make a living at this. And I said, well, I, you know, uh, as a philosopher, I was just happy to have a job and have a job at a business school is even better. Um, and she's right. It, it's common sense. I mean, I did figure out how to make a living at it, but it's common sense, you know, and figuring out, uh, I think most of the conscious capitalist companies, the CEOs that I've met think that they're going to be the winners. They're going to be the winners because they figure it out. Now, the second thing about this uh, question, uh, you know, part of it is conscious capitalism educating its customers. Part of it's any business educating its customers. But education is a critical process of give and take. Sometimes when we say educate our customers, what we mean, and I'm not saying you you mean this, Will, but I'm saying I've just heard it a lot. We mean take a customer's mouth, open it up real wide, and cram our position down their throat. Uh, and that's not a critical process that you give and take. Uh, that's getting them to, to accept our point of view. That's not harmonizing their in, in interests. That's making them play the same notes. Uh, and so again, this is a lot harder to do, uh, I think, than oftentimes uh, people give the impression. And it's often a lot harder to do than uh, the impression that I often give about it, because I think the, the logic of doing it the moral imperative of doing it is so strong, uh, it's oftentimes uh, easy to see it's difficult. I remember, uh, this, I know it's a long a a answer, but uh, I, I remember many years ago, I, I, I trained Taekwondo for many years and our teacher um, would, would have us do some something that no, no human being could do trying to, you know, put your foot around or no human being was my age could do trying to put your foot around your ear or, you know, whatever it was turned out. And then he was, he was, we're all sweating, you know, and it's awful. And uh, uh, he would, he would stop and ask us easy to do or difficult to do. And we, the right answer, regardless of when he asked that was very difficult, Kilsnim, uh, very difficult teacher. And he says, of course it's difficult. Why waste your time doing easy stuff? Why waste your time starting a business uh, that's just about making money? You know, the, the beautiful thing about conscious capitalism is it asks you to do hard stuff. Uh, and that's one of the reasons it's worth doing. Sorry, that was a way too long answer. I, I apologize for that. No, that was great. Thank you, Ed. Um, and actually following up on that, we have one attendee who's asking, what do you feel are the greatest obstacles within the different ands? What, what are the greatest challenges here? Well, that's another great question. I mean, the, the, uh, we didn't write too much about, about that uh, in the book. The biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest challenge is, is up here. It's getting over the, 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 the way we want to see those as a trade-off. You know, and seeing them as going together and constantly asking the question, 
gee, how can I get stakeholders and shareholders or all my stakeholders, because shareholders are stakeholders too, how can I get them to win, win, win? How can I figure out how to do this within the confines of our purpose? Uh, how can we figure out what we can do, what we can do on societal uh, issues like uh, how can we get give people who haven't had opportunities more opportunities? How can we increase the amount of freedom in our communities? Uh, and these these questions and constantly asking them, rather than getting always caught up and the the, the, the details are of course important, but constantly uh, getting getting caught up in uh, a lot of the models and uh, that sort of stuff that we have about business now. Uh, both those things are important. I want to ask, how do we use the models to make better decisions uh, that are consistent with our purpose, with what we're doing with our stakeholders, uh, et cetera. So I, I think the biggest barrier is overcoming the, gee, this is a trade-off and I don't have time to, to do otherwise. Uh, and it's like, trade-offs are fine, they're easy, and you failed. It's a failure of moral imagination. And hey, that happens sometimes. Sometimes we're not as creative as we need to be. And sometimes, you know, there's just, the, the, there's, there's, the, the trade-offs bump up against each other and there's not, we just can't think of a way out of it. But if we don't try, we're certainly not going to think of a way out of it. The biggest barrier to purpose is very straightforward. Purpose doesn't live in the mouse pad. Purpose doesn't live in the, in the saying on the coffee mug. Purpose lives in the processes and systems. It lives in the, the structures, the, the way we experience every day in companies. And most companies are not willing to examine that. Uh, most companies are content to say people are important and not examine that they have a lousy HR system. Uh, the biggest barriers uh, to stakeholders uh, is uh, really the sort of default position that I got to make trade-offs. Uh, what CEOs uh, have told me uh, that are not necessarily allied with their conscious capitalism movement is they didn't learn how to deal with societal issues. I, I don't know how to deal with this stuff. Um, the, the biggest barrier to ethics is simply, um, you know, this, this separation between this is a business decision and this is an ethics decision. Uh, to say ethics doesn't play a role is itself an ethical claim. Uh, and so there's no escape from that. And the biggest uh, barrier uh, to bringing our humanity to business is, is our fear that if, if we uh, act like a real human beings, express love, express fear, people will think that uh, we're weak or weird or whatever. Uh, so that's a good question. I need, to, I need to think about that. I need to think about a better answer uh, for you, Anonymous Adendi. So there's another question that really follows up on your last point about even saying something is not an ethical question is an ethical question from Muhammad Shah, who writes, most business policies are developed by civil servants or economists, and uh, they have more of a transactional mindset. As a young researcher, what could he really focus on that helps economists and ethicists come closer to solve today's complex problems? Well, I, look, may, maybe policy makers will figure out stuff that's better. I hope they do. Uh, I, I don't have much to say about that because uh, my hope is on real businesses and starting real businesses uh, that can uh, be based on relationships. Uh, I agree that, that what you said is uh, you know, exactly uh, right a lot of the time. Uh, I hope that what happens is as the conscious capitalists and, and, and other movements progress, we end up putting more pressure on policymakers and politicians to do better. We're already seeing that at some level. 
We're seeing it at mostly local le levels, where if you look at Jeff Cherry's work with the city of Ball Baltimore, uh, and I, I just learned of an incredible uh, uh, organization uh, founded by Steve Wanta. He used to be part of the uh, uh, Whole Foods, a Whole Planet found, found, found Foundation uh, called Just, uh, helping uh, women entrepreneurs who've been shut out of uh, the, the business, et cetera. As we get more of those things are going, uh, hopefully we can build a better politics as well. We certainly need to. So I'd focus on those things, not on the, on the policy, national policy level. I, I, I mean, more power to you if you do. I've just kind of given up on that. Well, let's look beyond policy, and I'm curious just what your answer would be to the question of bridging the gap between economists and ethicists and how they approach the concept of business, because you are articulating a different way of looking at business than what economists have the last several decades really approached business with. Well, I would say last several hundred years. I mean, if we, if we go back to Adam Smith, uh, uh, what I'm saying is perfectly consistent with that. Uh, Adam Smith wrote not only The Wealth of Nations, but he wrote The, the Theory of Moral sen Sentiments, the first sentence of which says how our interests are interconnected. Um, you know, uh, if you look at uh, economists like Amartya Sen, who very much understands uh, how ethics and economics are connected, and he wrote this little book, which is extremely readable, called, I think, Ethics and Economics. Uh, and that's uh, a very interesting take on what went wrong with economics. Uh, or if you read a philosopher named Hilary Putnam called the end of the fact value dichotomy in which he analyzes how economists in their quest to be scientists have uh, ignored uh, questions of values and ethics, uh, et cetera. And then if you look at the economist, uh, Alexander, who have done all of the uh, work in, a, a lot of work in decision the theory, who uh, follow people like John Rawls, the philosopher and others, there actually are a lot of economists who, uh, who understand how these things are connected. Thomas Schelling won the Nobel Prize uh, for, for understanding uh, these things. Um, the economists that we listen to in terms of um, in in terms of uh, policy uh, often don't have a view of business that's very robust, and that's because seeing a business as uh, purely interested in maximizing profits uh, does two things. One, it's a simplifying assumption. Uh, I, I would think. Most economists, unless they're drinking their own bathwater, don't actually think that's what makes human beings uh, a tick. I hope they don't raise their children like, like that, uh, for sure. Uh, and second, there's another argument here that's kind of a, a classical liberal argument that says, look, even if we're completely self-interested, we can cooperate together. Uh, and there have been, you know, tremendous, uh, I mean, we're not completely self-interested, but even if we were, uh, the most powerful thing we could get are cooperative solutions where there's conflict. Uh, and so I, I, when I sort of hammer economists, I, I don't know what I, I kind of mean people who think only about, you know, short-term self-interest and, you know, maybe that's, too many people that have been drinking their own bath water here. I'm, I'm not sure. Thank you, Ed. And I know we're at time, but if you're willing to give us another minute, there's one last question sure. I'd like to ask you, which is from Hideto Nishitani, who's, who asks, many board members of corporate America have not gotten the human-centered corporate governance notion, mm -hmm. and hence not many changes have been made in the way business has practiced even after, say, the business roundtable announcement. So. How can we change the attitude of board members more towards a conscious capitalist way to get out of the transactional way of thinking as a board and more to the relational thinking, this, this yes and thinking? Well, a couple of things. That's a really great question. Uh, first of all, Alexander, you, you talked about 
my being affiliated with the Business Roundtable Institute for Corporate Ethics. Now, that ended some time ago. I just got to take it out of my uh, C, C, CV. Uh, and so I didn't have anything to do uh, with that announcement. My fist was pumping in the air to support them, but, but you know, uh, look, that's going to take time. Uh, I think what we can do is show a different way. Uh, the, the first rule of the arts, of the creative arts, is show, don't tell. Uh, and we need more showing. You know, we need more examples of board members uh, who um, have, have done it differently. I gave a seminar uh, last week, I think, to a, a directors and boards group. Uh, and again, I was a little disappointing at the level of questions. The level of questions were around, I, I thought Lynn Stout had exploded the myth that shareholders own corporations, uh, et cetera. Legally, they don't. Corporations own themselves, uh, even in Delaware. Uh, and so I, I was a little stunned uh, at how deep this myth of the shareholder uh, turns out to be. Um, there are some changes in corporate governance that we need, uh, I think around uh, uh, voting rights and, and how long you have to hold shares. But again, showing not telling, uh, I think is the way to do that. Uh, I, I would also offer if anybody has uh, questions they want to ask me, I'm, I'm easy to find. I answer my email. Uh, and these have been really terrific. Ed, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for, Thanks for having um, me. being the humble leader that you are and the insightful leader and just everything that you're doing with Conscious Capitals and giving us your time today. Thanks. And Thanks, Alexander.